If you have your copy of Scripture, turn to the book of Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 22, and we're going to learn that one of the names that God goes by is Jehovah Jireh. You may have heard that name before. Jehovah Jireh means, Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide. Isn't that a wonderful name to know that our God is a provider? The funny thing about Jehovah Jireh is, is that we really don't fully understand that God is a provider and how he provides until we get in trouble. What, what God's going to do today is reveal himself to Abraham and to us in a very difficult, scary, hard time. And I would just say that all the names that we're going to hear about as we go through this series, that, that God reveals himself to us the best when times are the hardest or the darkest or when we need him the most. And so to kind of prepare you to get you ready for where we're going to be today, I want to ask you a couple of questions. And here's the first one. Is there anything that God could ask of you that would push you to the limit where you would say no? Now, I want you to think about that because our first response is, is no. No, there's nothing that God could ask of me that would push me too far. Okay, well, how about this? What if God said, I want you to get up, I want you to leave your family, I want you to leave your country, and I'm going to send you to a place, but I'm not going to tell you where you're going. You're just going to have to follow me. Would that be too much? How about if God asked you to follow him even when your family didn't and wouldn't? Would you do it? How about when God says, I'm going to make a promise to you, a very powerful and wonderful promise to you, but you're going to have to wait. And when you feel like you've waited long enough, I'm going to ask you to continue to wait. And when you've waited longer and you just feel like you can't wait any longer, I'm going to ask you to wait. Are you willing to wait on me? Are you willing to trust me? Are you willing to follow me? What if he were to ask you to sacrifice something very near and dear to you? To give up your future, to give up your plans, to walk away from things in your life that you hold dear? What if he said, hey, it's time. It's time for you to walk away and to follow me. You may think those are unfair questions, and you may wonder why we're starting this way, but the reason we're doing this is because you can't really fully understand Genesis 22 till you get those feelings, till you really kind of think through those questions, because every one of those questions God asked Abraham before we get to where we are today. Genesis chapter 12, we're introduced to Abraham, and here's what we get. God comes to this family and speaks to Abraham's father. And calls Abraham's father to leave his people, to leave his nation, to leave where he has grown up, where he has roots, to leave. And his father does. And he takes Abraham with him, but they only go so far. They stop in Haran, and then God speaks to Abraham and says, I want you to get away from your people, and I want you to follow me, and I'm going to take you to a place. You don't know where you're going, and I'm not going to tell you until you get there. And he left. And all along the way, God was continuing to ask Abraham to follow him and to believe him and to trust him. But ultimately, what God was asking him to do was come to believe that he is a God who provides. So he asked Abraham to leave and says, I'm going to provide you a country and I'm going to provide you a home. And Abraham went. And then he asked him to wait. He and his wife had not had children he desperately wanted a child. She desperately wanted a child. And God said, I'm going to give you a son. You're going to have kids and descendants. They're going to be like the stars of heaven and the sands on the seashore, but you got to wait. And we don't know, but we think that they waited about 35 or 45 years from the time that the promise came until they received Isaac. Isaac. And God was constantly asking him to trust that he provides. Now, let's be honest. We're going to read this passage today, and I just want to kind of hit you up front that when we read through this, you're going to begin to ask some questions. 
Why would God do this? Why would God ask this? I sure hope that God would never want me to do this. And we're going to try to answer all those questions today. But God steps into the life of Abraham again in his faith journey, and he asks a question. Abraham, are you going to trust me to provide? And that's the question I want to settle on you today. Do you trust God to provide? Genesis 22, verse 1. It came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go there and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so the two of them walked together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and he said, my father, And Abraham said, here I am, son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad. Do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, behind him, a ram was caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place Of his son. Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and you have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. Your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. It came about after these things that it was told to Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, also born children to your brother Nahor, Uz, his firstborn, and Buz, his brother, and Kimuel, the father of Aram, and Chesed, and Hazo, and Pildash, and Jildapah, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. Those eight, these eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Reuma, also bore Teba, and Gaham, and Tahash, and Maacah. Tough story, huh? Not the kind of question that you want God to be asking you, right? Not the kind of test of faith that we want to have. So how do we how do we deal with this? How do we unpack this? How do we look at this? Well, we get into Genesis 22, and it very plainly says that God tested Abraham. And the reality that we all need to face is part of the faith journey that we have with God is God is going to test us. That's what it is. And it's so foreign to us, unfortunately, that anytime the testing comes into our life, we want to reject it and we want to run from it. We don't want this in our life. And we start asking these questions. Why would God do this? And will he do this to me? Well, before we get too far down the track, I think it's very important that we understand the difference between temptation and testing. That we understand the difference between temptation and testing. God was not tempting Abraham to do evil. And unfortunately, here's the problem. When we think about temptation, or especially when we think about testing, here's what we think. God is punishing me. If you had been in Abraham's shoes and God had come to you and said, I want your child, what would your first thought be? I'll be honest. 
my first thought would be, God, what have I done wrong? Why are you punishing me? What have I done to deserve this? And we need to understand there's a difference between testing and temptation. Temptation leads us to do evil. And God does not lead us to do evil. In James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, we are told that when we are tempted, it's not because God has brought temptation to us, because God is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt us with evil. And so one of the things that we have to understand that this isn't a temptation for him to do wrong. This isn't a temptation for Abraham to murder his child and commit child sacrifice like every other nation was doing at that time. In fact, we believe that the people that Abraham had been called out of committed child sacrifice. And what he had learned from the God that he knew at this point was God didn't want child sacrifice. So God is not tempting him to do evil. It's a test. So what is a test? Testing deepens our faith and our spiritual maturity. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 these great bookends to this beginning in, in James chapter one, you have the beginning here where it talks about testing. And when we read things like that, we think James is a little bit crazy. He says, consider it all joy. Consider it all joy when God brings trials and testing into your life. Does anybody feel joyful when trials and testing come into your life? Do you say, woohoo, I get to have trials today. Here's what James says, we should. We should consider it all joy because here's the thing, God brings these tests into our life to deepen our faith and grow us in spiritual maturity. That's what he says in James 1, 2 through 4. Count it all joy because here's the thing, as you're going through these things, it produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces complete faith in us. It deepens, it strengthens, and grows. Testing deepens our faith and our spiritual maturity. Now, here's something that's going to be very powerful as we walk through this today, and here's something you need to understand, that God is in absolute control of all tests that come into our life. We read this passage, and it scares us because this could go off the rails really quick, right? We, we, we listen to this as God asks something of Abraham and we think, I don't, I don't want this to happen in my life because there's so many things that could go wrong. What if I misunderstand? What if I do something wrong? What if I, you know, what if it doesn't happen? What if this doesn't work? And we have to remember that all testing that comes into our life is under the absolute control and authority of God. Nothing happens outside of his control. There was no way for this to go sideways in Abraham's life because God had his hand on it. And we need to remember that every time the testing and trial comes into our life, it passes through God's hands and God's plan first. No testing that comes into our life doesn't pass through God's hands first. And here's the thing we need to remember. And here's what God is trying to pull out of Abraham and us today. Is God good? Is God kind? Is God compassionate? Is God just? Does God know what he's doing? Does God know what's best for us? Does he have what's best for us in his mind? If we believe all those things to be true and nothing comes into our life except what passes through his hands, what does that mean? It means in God's goodness and kindness and compassion and mercy, he's brought this into our life for a reason. And it's never outside of his plan. God's plan for all of us is to make us look more like Jesus. And something we need to understand, and this is the problem I think that we struggle with, putting our faith in God is not the end of our journey, it's the beginning. It's not enough for God to say to us, I want you to believe in me, I want you to confess me, I want you to follow me. 
what God is saying. I want the rest of your life to be about me. And I want the rest of your life to grow in me. I want the rest of your life to be surrendered to me. And so here's the thing. Putting our faith in God is not the end of the journey. It's the beginning. And for many of us, Let me tell you, I I missed that point for a long time in my life. Here's what I would say. I would show up on Sunday morning and I would hear a sermon like this and I would think it was for somebody else because here's what I would say. I already believe in Jesus. I've checked the box. And what God was asking of Abraham and what God is asking of us, it's not checking a box. It's every moment, every circumstance, every area of our life, are we going to say yes Are we going to trust him to be who he is? Are we going to trust him to provide for us? There's a little phrase that I've begun to say to myself, and I use this in a lot of ways, to illustrate what this faith journey looks like in Jesus. And here it is. Saying yes to God sets us free. Continuing to say yes to God keeps us free. See, here's the reality We're willing to say yes to God, to enter in a relationship to him, but we're not so willing down the road when he's asking for more commitment, when he's asking for more surrender, when he's asking for more of who we are, we're not as willing to say yes. And so what he's trying to teach Abraham and what he's trying to teach us is this. There's not one yes in our life. There's millions. The word that you need to learn to respond to God is very simple. It's just yes. Whatever God says, we say yes. Whatever God asks, we say yes. Wherever God leads, we say yes. Saying yes sets you free. Continuing to say yes keeps you free. And that's what we find with Moses. Now, I want to give you two purposes that God has in testing and why he tests us. One purpose in testing is to display his nature, his character, his power, and his glory. Now, this doesn't sound comforting to us, does it? I don't want to have to go through a trial to understand God better. Can't I just read about it in a book? Can't I just hear about it in a sermon? Can't you just give me a Bible study? Yeah, we have all those things, but here's the problem. Just like everything else, we don't fully learn the lesson until we experience it. I can stand here all day and tell you how good and gracious and compassionate God is, and all that's true. But till I've experienced that in the deepest, darkest, scariest times of my life, I never really know that's true. I can tell you, God will be there when you need him the most, Because that's what the Bible says. But until I've experienced that in my life, until you've experienced it in your life, you'll never know that to be true. And so here's what happens. God allows these things in our life called tests so that we begin to understand who he is more. In fact, what we see in this whole scenario with Abraham and Isaac God is trying to settle Abraham in one clear fact and one clear fact alone that he provides. He's trying to settle Abraham with this test. Now, here's the thing we're going to talk about in a second. This isn't just one test. It's been one of many tests that he's had. And every one of them pushing for the same thing. Abraham, who are you going to trust to provide for you? Who are you going to trust to make the promise happen? Who are you going to trust to make these things work out in your life? And so God comes to Abraham and asks the ultimate. I want you to surrender your son to me. I want you to surrender your son to me. So that Abraham would come to say what he said. I believe I'm going to have my child back. Did you catch that when we read it? He goes and he takes two guys with him and they journey three days to where God was leading him to go. And as they get to the place, he says, this is where we're going. You guys stay here with all the supplies. I'm gonna go with Isaac. We're gonna worship God. And Isaac and I are going to come back. 
They're walking up the mountain and Isaac says, dad, I see the fire. Dad, I see the wood. Um, I don't see a sacrifice. And what does he say to Isaac? Isaac, God will provide for himself. God will provide for himself. And that's the second purpose of why God brings testing into our life. He wants to reveal the depth and sincerity of our faith. Listen, this was never about sacrificing Isaac. Never. God doesn't condone child sacrifice. We see it condemned over 35 times in the Old Testament. In fact, God asked for an entire people to be wiped out because they sacrificed their children. So why all of this? Why do this? Why ask of these things? Because here's the thing. He's wanting Abraham to be faced with the reality. Who am I going to trust to provide? Now, I will say, many people who want to discredit the Bible, this is one of the first places they go to, and they love to rip it out of context. I've had people come to me and say, how can you believe in a God that would ask someone to sacrifice their son to him? I'm like, oh, that's not the worst thing. Did you know that he asked him to get up and leave his country and tell him he was going to go to a place and he didn't know where he was going to go and he was just going to show him? Did you know that he asked him and his nephew Lot to, you know, stay in the same area and they made a bad choice and Lot went to Sodom and Abraham let him go? Did you know that he went to Egypt and God told him to to live with his wife and to go down into Egypt and yet he wouldn't tell anybody that she was his wife? He lied about it and said that, that she was his sister twice and brought plagues on different groups of people because he lied about it. Like, let's get the whole story right. God was asking a lot of Abraham all through this scenario. And the reason that this seems so stark and so crazy is because we don't know the rest of the story. When we see God's relationship to Abraham and to us, and he's asking these steps of faith, that it doesn't scare us as much. This is to deepen his faith and his spiritual maturity. God's purpose in testing us is to reveal who he is so that we will really know, we will experience him in a completely different way. And then to deepen our faith and our spiritual maturity. Testing reveals what is most important to us. When we get tested, When God shows up and begins asking those difficult questions, are you going to follow me? Are you going to trust me to provide? Are you going to surrender to me? Are you going to go where I tell you to go? Are you going to do what I tell you to do? We begin to see what's most important in our life. And we'll cover this again in a minute, but the reality is the reason things like this in the Bible scares us is because we realize there are things in our life that are more important to us than God. There are things in our life that we have told ourselves and we've told other people that if God asked that of me, I'll say no. I'll say no. Testing begins to reveal to us what is most important. Now, here's the reality. We all know how to say the right thing. If I asked you what's most important in your life, you would say, God, God is my priority. He's the center. He's everything. Okay, well, God has said it's time for you to be a missionary. Mm, Sorry, no. God's asked you to walk across the street and share the gospel. Mm, Sorry, no. My comfort's more important. Testing begins to reveal what's most important. Testing forces us to remember God's work. I can't imagine Abraham coming to the place. Now, here's the thing. I don't know if you guys saw this, but the thing that always unnerves me when I read this passage is there's no emotion from Abraham. There's no like, wait, what, God? You're asking me to do what? I think the connection's kind of bad. My ears may be clogged up. I don't think I'm hearing you correctly. There's no stalling. There's no bargaining. There's no, no, God, don't do this. Take anything else. I'll give you anything else. 
There just seems to be this peace that has come over Abraham to where he just says, okay. God tells him, he gets up and goes. People question him and he says, we're gonna come back. God's gonna provide. And I think the reason is, is that that test came into his life. He begins to think about all those other moments in his life when God gave him an opportunity to trust in the fact that he would provide and he didn't. When God promised to give him a child and he and his wife decided they were gonna figure out another way. When God promised to bless him and his family and he and his lot thought, hey, he and his nephew lot thought, hey, the land that we're living on is not big enough for the both of us and God can't provide for both of us, so let's separate. When he had to lie, thinking that that was gonna protect his life and it didn't. I think what happened is it forced him to look back over his life and say, wait a second, God's been faithful before. God's provided before. I can trust him to provide now. And testing reflects our growth in faith. It reflects our growth in faith. It shows us what we've learned about God and what we've learned about ourselves and gives us an opportunity to put that in practice. And I want you to see this in practice in Abraham's life. Now, this may seem like a weird question, but I want to ask it anyway. Who was this test really for? See, we think that this was a test for Abraham, but I'm going to say that it's for Abraham and Isaac. See, we think Isaac was a small child when this happened. He really wasn't. We believe that the time frame between Genesis 21 and Genesis 22 when this happens is between 20 and 25 years. And if that's true, Isaac's either between 20 and 40 years old. Kind of changes it a little bit, doesn't it? This isn't just a test for Abraham. This is also a test for Isaac. Let's see what they've learned. Abraham learns that God is all I need because he's all I got. Corey Ten Boom said that you'll never fully realize that God is all you need until God is all you got. And Abraham had come to a place in his life where he recognized God is all I have. I have nothing else. Everything can be taken from me in a moment. He'd already experienced a lot of that in his life. Here he is in this place where he says, God is all I need because God is all I've got. He's come to learn that the most important thing is doing what God says when God says it. No more stalling, no more lying, no more trying to figure it out on his own, no more taking matters into his own hands. Look at what Abraham learned. When he's first called with his father, he goes, but they only go so far. And then he's called again and he goes, but then he has all these places where he's falling and he's lying and he's trying to figure things out. He's given a promise, but then he tries to fulfill the promise on his own. And then God comes in Genesis 22 and here's what he says. I want you to give me your son, your one and only son. No bargaining, no whining, no complaining just obedience. This is a very powerful thing. Abraham had learned in the trials and testing of his life that the most important thing is to say yes and to keep saying yes. He's learned that God always keeps his promises. God always keeps his promises. He's always faithful to do what he says he's going to do. In fact, Abraham has a tangible reminder of that. Who's standing next to him? Isaac. Every day when he got up and he hugged his boy and he kissed him and as he would go to work and do the things that he would do, every day was a reminder that God had delivered on the promise. People might come and say, how do you believe in this God? He never comes through and he's like, right here he is. Here's Isaac. 
And God had provided for him all along the way. And here's something that we need to remember. God is faithful to us even when we're not faithful to him. God continued to bless him. God continued to provide for him even when he lied. Even when he disobeyed. Even when he rebelled. Because God had made a promise. And that's something we need to hold on to. God has made promises to us. And he will not break those promises no matter what we do. He'd learned. He went from wavering in his faith to fully trusting. Now, I'm not saying he's perfect. I'm not saying that all of a sudden he didn't struggle and he didn't have issues. But what I'm saying is, is that there's a a learning curve that he went through and he began to realize the more I waver, the more I have doubts, the more I worry, and the more I try to take matters into my own hand, things get worse. Instead, my first response is going to be to fully trust God. I may not understand what he's doing. I may not understand why he's doing it. I may not understand what's going to happen from this, but here's what I've learned to understand. Just say yes. Just say yes and trust him. I think he fully believed that God would not take his son from him. I think he fully believed that even if he did have to do this, that even if he had to sacrifice his child, that God would give him back. Because he believed the promise that God had made to him that out of Isaac, out of Isaac, the promised child, all of these other people would come and all the nations of the world would be blessed. And so if God reneged on that promise, he wouldn't be God. And so Abraham says, I believe. Now here's the cool thing. The writer of Hebrews in his hall of faith recounts this story of Abraham in two verses. And here's what he says. We we believe this is from the Holy Spirit because nobody else could know this other than the Holy Spirit. He recounts Abraham as saying that I believe that God can raise my son from the dead. Do you know that there had not been a resurrection of anybody at this point? There was no such term as resurrection. Yet in Hebrews 11, here's what Abraham says. Abraham says, okay, God, you're asking this. I'm going to do this believing that God could bring his son back from the dead. And he kind of already had. God had waited until Sarah was 90-something years old. And even in those days when they lived a very long time, 90 years old was not the time to be having children. They would have a term for someone in that age. They would say that their womb was dead. They were barren. And yet here's what God does. God shows how powerful he is and that he's the God of life, that he opens a dead womb and brings forth a child. And here's what Abraham says. If God can do that, God can do anything. He'd learned. He'd grown. And he was willing to worship in this nightmare scenario. He says to the men, Isaac and I are going to go worship. Let me ask you a question. If that was looming over your life, would being here today be important to you? If you were pondering the loss of a child or pondering your loss of your spouse or pondering any kind of testing that might be going in your life, would you worship? Abraham had learned that the path to freedom is not running from God, it's running to God. And she says, even though this is not what I want, this is not what I have chosen, this is what God has brought into my life, and I'm going to worship him because he's good. He learned. Then we come to Isaac. Isaac. 
I've quoted the verse in Psalm chapter 9. It says, I know your name, so I put my trust in you. And I really think this is the test for Isaac. Isaac was growing up, and he'd grown up in a household where he'd heard all the stories of how God had worked in Abraham's life. He'd heard all the things that God had asked Abraham to do, but we don't know what Isaac's relationship to God was. He was well-versed enough in the worship of God that he knew he had fire and he had wood, but there was no sacrifice. Something was missing. It seems that God was introducing himself to Isaac in a very powerful way. I want you to surrender yourself to me. See, when we really look at this and think that Isaac was a grown man, he wasn't a child. It really changes everything because, again, we don't see Isaac fighting. Isaac listens to his father. His father says, God will provide, and they keep going, and he doesn't ask any more questions. They get to the mountain, and they build the altar, and they put the wood on the altar, and they got the fire going, and then I'm sure this is a very awkward conversation when Abraham says, okay, um, I need to tie you up now because I'm going to kill you. We don't get any fights. You know, Abraham was well over 100 by this time. Isaac's a pretty young man. I think Isaac could have took him. Isaac let himself be bound. Isaac let himself be laid on the altar. Isaac surrendered himself to God. This was a moment for Isaac to make faith in God, his own. Kids, let me tell you something. It's great to have parents who love Jesus and bring you to church and and teach you about him, but here's the reality. You can't live off their faith. It has to be your own. God spoke to Isaac in a very powerful way and asked a very difficult thing from Isaac because he wanted Isaac to put his trust in him to provide. Not his father, not his father's relationship to God, not what God was doing in the life of his father, but in him. The greatest thing you can do as a child is to make faith your own. To begin to say yes to Jesus and to keep saying yes to him. We've already talked about some application, but I want to give you two things I think would really help us apply this today. I wanted to save this to the end because I want to, I want to give it the, the power that it's due. Abraham says, God will provide for himself the lamb. God will provide for himself the sacrifice. Now, God writes these things in ways that we need to listen to and we need to understand, and and he puts all these context clues in to help us to see what's going on. And one of the most powerful things that you find in this interaction is when God tells Abraham to go to Mount Moriah. Moriah means provided by Yahweh. Every step of the way, God's telling him, I'm going to provide. But also every step of the way, this wasn't just for Abraham, it's for every generation that came after him and especially for us because here's what happens, Moriah is a very special place. We hear about Moriah again when David was king of Israel and they were about to bring the ark back in and they needed a place to, 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 to sanctify it and, and set apart and so he buys this threshing floor in Moriah, the very same place where this happened. And years later, David's son Solomon built the temple on Mount Moriah. Moriah means provided by God. What did God provide? He provided everything. And this story is a glimpse, it's a shadow of what's going to happen when Jesus comes. That God steps into our life and says, listen, I want to show you something. I want to to give you this test to show you that I will provide for you. 
And so I've put out this mountain called Moriah. I'm not gonna take your son. I'm gonna provide for you. I'm gonna build this temple. I'm gonna have these people. And one day, because it says it later in this chapter, all the nations will be blessed through Isaac, through Abraham. One day I'm gonna send my seed. I'm gonna send my son. And he's gonna go to Moriah as your substitute. Moriah means Yahweh provides. God provided a place where the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world would come. God provided a perfect, spotless sacrifice for all of our sins. God provided full, free forgiveness, restoration, and victory. God provided eternal, abundant, and everlasting life. And God provided, and here's what he said, I don't need or want your help in providing for you. I don't need or want your sacrifices to pay for sin. I will provide. All of this was set up to help us understand that we cannot surrender ourselves to pay for our sin that we need a substitute and that God will provide the substitute for himself. But the application also is God is all I need because he's all I got. We come to moments in our life when testing comes, when darkness comes, when scary things happen and we begin to say, why me? Why now? God, how could you do this to me? And we read things like this in the Bible and it scares us to death. What if God asked that of me? What if? What if he asked that of you? It's only a nightmare situation. It's only a nightmare scenario if God is not in control of everything. It's so easy, it's so easy to see the darkness and to feel the fear and think that's the only thing there is. When standing behind all of that is the God who sits above it all on his throne, who's in absolute control of everything, including you. It's only a nightmare if God isn't who he says he is and doesn't do what he says he does. And when these things come into our life and we ask these questions, we start to think God's punishing us, but he's not. He wants you to know him better. God will never test us without providing for us. I hope you see through this Everything was provided before this ever happened. Everything was ready before this ever happened. There was never a point where this went sideways. There was never a point when this was out of control. There was never a point when God had not provided. In fact, he tells Abraham, go to the place called I will provide. And guess what? I will provide. And he did. Nothing that you face in your life will be without God's provision. Nothing is too impossible for God. Nothing's too big, nothing's too scary, nothing's too overwhelming. It confronts who we think he is and how he works in our life. Listen, I'm not standing here as an expert. I'm not scolding you or chiding you. I'm standing here as someone who struggles with these things. And I'm trying to help you see what God's working in my life and what he was working in Abraham's life. Every step of the way, he brings us a little closer to him. Every step of the way, he asks us to trust him a little bit more, to surrender a little bit more. And the cool thing is this didn't happen in the first part of Abraham's life, it happened after he had multiple encounters with God. 
Is there a limit to you serving God? Is there anything that God could ask that you would say is too much? It's too far. Is there a limit? Only you know that. And I want you to ask yourself that question today. Is there a limit? Maybe the limit for some of you is coming to the moment where you surrender yourself to Jesus to allow him to save you forever. I'm a good person. I do good things. Yeah, but you're not his. Maybe it's too much that he asks you to live a holy and pure life and you really want to hang on to the sin in your life that he doesn't want there. Maybe the limit is there's things that are happening in your life that cause fear and doubt and worry, and you just think, I can't get over this, and I can't do anything about this, and this is just the way that it is. Maybe the limit is him asking you to go and live out your faith and share it with other people to join a church and be a part of a church family. I don't know what your limit is, but here's the thing. Why is it there? Why are you placing a limit and saying, I can't do this, when God has clearly told you, I will provide? The problem is not God. The problem is I. God's never asked you to save yourself. He's never asked you to clean up your life yourself. He's never asked you to go witness yourself. He says, I will provide. Will you let him provide today? Let's pray. Father, I just pray today that we would say yes. That today would can begin and continue that journey in our life of saying yes and keep saying yes and keep saying yes and to watch you provide. So this morning, Father, I know that some of the things that you're asking us to say yes to feel like what you've asked Abraham. Feel like you're asking us to walk away from everything, to give up everything, to sacrifice everything. And that's because we don't see that if we do that, we get everything because we get you. So let today be the day that we say yes. We ask it in Jesus' holy and precious name. It's in his name we pray. Amen.